Hey YouTube, today we'll be talking about race. As Julie Andrews would say, let's start from the very beginning. Now race is defined as a group of people identified as distinct from other groups because of supposed shared physical or genetic characteristics. Now these characteristics can include skin color, bone structure, hair color, or eye color. It's a social rather than biological category, and it's one of the ways that we read each other's bodies and ascribe meaning to them. So what does this mean? First of all, when we say that race is a social rather than scientific category, we mean that race is something that is socially constructed rather than biologically based. Uh, come again? Basically, Basically, social construction is the way in which society groups and categorizes different things. It's the way in which we create meaning about different individuals, groups, or ideas through social or cultural practice. Or in other words, how we create meaning through our interactions with others. A good example of social construction would be the way in which we associate pink with girls and blue with boys. Now pink and blue as colors themselves don't really say much, but they have meaning because we give them meaning. These colors only have these associations because we agree and perpetuate that they do. You'll hear this term a lot in sociology or when talking about concepts like race and gender. Uh, yeah, Kaylee, I have a question. Um, how can race be socially constructed when people clearly look different? Great question, YouTube. Well, it's true that different physical characteristics traditionally associated with different groups of people, skin color, for example, are determined by genetics. There's no one race gene that delineates racial categories. Come again? The genes determining skin color are no different than the genes that determine your eye color or your height or whether or not you can curl your tongue or flare your nostrils. There is no one gene that separates one race from another. And in fact, the truth of the matter is that there's more genetic variety within races than there is between them. Therefore, race is something that society defines its shapes. One example of the way that we do this is through racial stereotypes, or rather generalized qualities or tendencies assigned to groups of people. So some stereotypical images would be poor women of color, particularly black women, stereotyped as the welfare queen, or that people from the Middle East are terrorists. Now the problem with these and other stereotypes is that it generalizes groups of people in ways that lead to discrimination. With racial stereotypes, the truth doesn't matter. It's just whether or not people believe it to be true. And stereotypes such as these are just one of the ways in which we take a person's appearance and assign meaning to their bodies. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, race is social, not biological. Why is this an important distinction to make? One of the reasons for this is that by locating race only within the body and claiming difference on the basis of genetics, we're opening the door to justify social inequalities as natural. Whoa, Kaylee, that's a pretty big leap in logic. Why would you say that? Well, I mean, it's not that big of a leap. If this were Frogger, I'd be splattered on the side of the road. But one of the reasons I say this is because it's already been done. Now there's a lot of examples throughout history of how science was and is used as a justification for racial inequality. Around the time of European exploration and colonization, you know when Europeans started discovering new continents and people, there was a growing anxiety about who was and was not considered human. Part of this anxiety had a religious basis. If they weren't human, did they have souls? Or more to the point, if they weren't human, did they have rights? Walk with me. If I'm a colonizing nation and I find that the land that I want is already inhabited by millions of people, but those people aren't human in the way that I am and they don't have rights, then I can justify slaughtering them and taking their land. Or I can justify enslaving them. Basically, it can go a lot of ways. Inevitably, the question came up of whether or not God created different species of humans. This, of course, led to the question in evolutionary theory of polygenesis versus monogenesis. Or rather, the question of whether humans developed in separate populations or whether we all shared one ancestor. Spoiler alert, we all share an ancestor. But this eventually led to the idea of the great chain of being, in which animals were on the bottom, humans were in the middle, and God stood at the top. Now within this great chain existed different levels of humanity, arranged through a hierarchy of, you guessed it, race. And in this chain, Anglo-Saxon whiteness was considered to be closest to God. Mm -hmm. This hierarchy, by the way, is where we got the idea that superior races produce superior cultures, and concerns about the degradation of superior racial stock through miscegenation, or race mixing. Hmm. Unless you believe this was all in the past and we live in some enlightened utopia where race doesn't matter. I'm sorry to tell you that this preoccupation with the boundaries of racial categories continues today. Take a look at the KKK or different neo-Nazi organizations. Furthermore, who belongs to these racial categories, or rather who is considered what, has shifted and continues to shift over time. For example, ethnic groups that we might consider white today, like the Irish, weren't always considered so. And something that you might find interesting, in Jim Crow era segregation, Oklahoma laws labeled Native Americans as white, while some Chinese Americans found themselves in an out of the category of whiteness depending on their location. Now there are a lot of reasons for these shifting categories, but usually it's because it serves some political or social agenda to shift the category of whiteness. The opposite end of the spectrum being blackness, because when we're talking about race relations, at least in the United States, we're usually talking about it within a black and white binary. But we'll get into that later. For now, just keep in mind that laws governing blackness also existed and 
and have been around since colonial America. Children of an interracial union were considered non-white, and a little later down the road, any presence of black ancestry within your family history meant you were labeled as black. This not one drop categorization is called the principle of hypo descent, which basically means that if a child has parents who belong to different socioeconomic, racial, or ethnic groups, they belong to the subordinate group. This goes back to that lovely idea of preserving the racial stock. Now this process of deciding who and who does not belong to what category is called racial formation, and it's how the social, economic, and political forces determine the content and importance of racial categories and how they assign racial meanings. This racial formation thing is important because it determines who has access to what resources and privileges and who is excluded from them. Because hey, Racism. There it is. So what is racism exactly? Racism can be defined as any program or practice of discrimination, segregation, persecution, or mistreatment based on membership within a race or ethnic group. It's prejudice and discrimination based on perceptions of racial difference and ideas of superiority and inferiority. Now we'll be going a lot more in depth on this topic in an upcoming week because it deserves a video of its own. For now, keep in mind that while we've talked a lot about how race is something that we've constructed ourselves, it has real world consequences. It's not just a way in which others try to define us, but it's a way in which we define ourselves. And despite what some people may think, ignoring race doesn't mean racism just disappears. And we can't ignore differences just because they make us uncomfortable. Race is an important part of a person's identity, whether they know it or not. But that's a subject for another video. For now, I'm out of time. As always, if you're interested in learning more, check out the links in the description below and feel free to ask questions in the comments. Today's question is, how does your racial identity play a role or take shape in your life? Now, my next video may look a little different because I'm defending my thesis in a few days. In it, I'll be reflecting on this project as it stands now and how it functions in a broad discussion of social issues. But until then, happy unlearning!